So, uh, I'm going to make three videos to talk about the oil carbon device that we've been working on. Now, the oil carbon device is actually really, really interesting, I think so, and there are lots of good reasons why it's interesting, and we're going to go through some of those. We've been making our oil carbon device from this stuff, which is a modified carbon ink that we use. Now, we've been using that to paint onto substrates like this. Got a bit of graphol, we've got our carbon ink, and we're getting great results from it. But it does lead to a problem. That is, when it's put onto a current collector backing like this graphol, which is relatively heavy and relatively thick, and we have this thin layer of material on it, then however good the uh, charge storage capabilities, the energy density of this ink is, the weight ratio of the active material to the current collector means that the finished device is going to actually have quite a poor energy density. So it leads us to a problem, and that problem is how to increase that weight ratio. Turns out, painting on thicker and thicker layers of ink don't work. So it took us quite a while to work out how to do this, and we're quite proud of it, actually. What we've done is we've turned our ink into this structured carbon foam. This particular one's about half a millimetre thick, and it's uh, three centimetres by three centimetres, and it weighs 0.75 of a gram, or something like that. Once we make it into this thin foam here, then we can put it onto the current collector and now we're altering the weight ratio. The reason we can do that is that we're using an aqueous electrolyte. Aqueous electrolytes don't suffer from the same problems that organic electrolytes do. That is, they're far more conductive or less resistive. Whereas organic electrolytes have such a high resistivity or poor conductivity within them that there's a limitation on the thickness of the film that can be put onto the current collector. And that's why most of the devices you actually see using organic electrolytes are roughly 60% support material and uh, somewhere between 30 and 40% active material. It's one of the reasons why when you read the specification of uh, a lithium-ion battery, it tells you it's 128 what hours per kilo, and when you weigh an actual device, you turn out, it turns out it's around about 25 watt hours per kilo because of all the needed support structure. So it becomes a relatively interesting problem on how to thicken up the layer of material and what limit you can make that layer of the material so that your ratio of active material to current collector is brought down. That brings up the uh, energy density and specific energy of a finished device. And that's what we've been really interested in. So the three videos we're going to make are this one to discuss the internals. Another one where we look at the difference between the charge voltages and why there can be a difference between charge voltages. And a third one where actually we're just going to charge up a device and discharge it in front of you. And if you really want, you can watch it for half an hour and see the capacity to discharge. The point being that the meters will be there so that you can stop it every second, pull off the figures yourself, pop them into a spreadsheet and verify the results all by yourself. You just have to do the power calculation and you will know what that energy density is for that particular device in that setup with that load for that duration of time. So it's kind of like a kind of verification. If you like, you can check it yourself if you want. Now, what we've done when we've made this um, carbon structured foam here is really, really important because this one is about half a millimetre thick and it's three centimetres by three centimetres, um, giving two of them together roughly with a volume of about one cubic centimetre, round about there. The weight of this is 0.75 grams, so when we put those two together we get roughly a weight of about one and a half grams, something like that. We want to know at what thickness can we uh, make that? When is the increase in resistance because it's thicker, offset against the increase in power that we can store against that, so the ratio of the finished device has a high, high enough or acceptable enough energy density that we can start shouting about it. We've done it half a millimetre, and there's some excellent results. We're going to show you those results. Now, the obvious next step is to um, take it up to a couple of millimetres and see what happens at a couple of millimetres, and obviously we're going to be doing that. The reason we're concentrating so much on this old carbon device is that the active material is a standing, in that at 2 volts it approaches the energy density of lead acid, and at 2.4 volts it approaches the energy density of lithium ion. And that's very cool for an old carbon material, because the cost of making this device turns out to be somewhere about, around about $5 or $10 per kilowatt hour. When you compare that with lead acid, which is 70, and when you compare it with um, lithium iron, which is around about 200, then in terms of cost of production, it really, um, I think, is a huge advancement. Now, it's 
particularly easy to make in that we take our carbons, we do the um, formation on them, we make them up into an ink. There is very little in the way of waste stream generated in that. And this is an all carbon device. Now I've used graphol current collectors, so there's a number of reasons I've used graphol current collectors. One is they don't take part in any reactions or uh, any part of the cells, so they're very stable, so it gives me a nice figure that is uh, directly related to the activity of the active material rather than the contribution that a current collector might be making. I don't have to use graphol, it works quite well with stainless steel actually, but I like the idea of using graphol because if I use graphol with our structured carbon and, uh, on both sides, I literally have an all carbon device. The electrolyte in here incidentally is just salt water. So if I have my all carbon device and I use it a few times and want to get rid of it, then I can put it into a case that snaps open, pull out that carbon and what I'm left with is a lump of salty carbon. If I just dry it, then I could barbecue my chicken on it. It would make no difference. So I throw it away, it's not going to hurt anything. It is just carbon and salt. I think that's really awesome for end of life. Another aspect of that, of course, is there is no value within this system apart from the energy it stores. There's no intrinsic metal value. There's no metal to recover from it, and so there's no reason to um, carry away one that might not be looked at. There's no value there, there's no way of recovering that value apart from the energy it stores. So it makes it inherently a um, safe device to leave lying around. Who would bother stealing it? The idea of there being no metal and no recovery available in there is also something that makes disposal that much easier. So the end of life has a much lower cost than it would if it was a metal or toxic system. The lack of waste stream for producing the carbon ink is also another one of those great benefits, I think. Another one of the benefits of this system is that the minimal capex requirement actually for this is a paintbrush and a pair of scissors. You can make these devices just by painting the ink out and cutting it up with little squares with a piece of scissors and putting it together. I mean, it would take you forever, but it is possible to do. So to my mind, this all-carbon device, which is essentially a supercapacitor, incidentally, is an immensely interesting device. And it's one of the devices that we actually want to seriously lead off with. Now, obviously, we have a, a slight problem leading off with this. And one of the reasons that we do the CR2032 so much, which actually is two main reasons, one of them is it's pretty much standard with any, any lab to test a new system in a CR2032. And the other is we have the machinery to do it. So we have the press and we have the cutters, and they cost about £4,000. This stuff's really expensive. People often say you ought to make an 18650, and yes, I would love to make an 18650. The problem there is the machinery for an 18650 costs in the region of £200,000. So I would love to have £200,000 to buy the machinery to make 18650s. Now, of course, I could send it out for toll manufacture, but actually, there's a whole lot of things you need to do between the stage we've got here and being able to manufacture it as a mass market product that necessitates putting up a pilot line here. We have to work out things like the viscosity of the ink, the thickness of the ink, the uh, coating thickness, the time through the heating ovens, uh, the calendar and press uh, thickness at the end of the, the roll when it comes off. We have to work all that out. That obviously takes a lot of time to work out, and we obviously need the machine to be able to work that out to make a technical manual that would lead to a production. Now, the reason we have to do that is because £200,000 in terms of production cost is very low. If we wanted a, uh, a full manufacturing of these devices, you're talking of millions of pounds. So the pilot scale is something we have to go through in order to uh, bulk manufacture any of these devices. So we want to lead off with this all-carbon device. We obviously have the um, stage one device that we're pretty close to finishing and the stage two and stage three that Steve's working on. All those devices need pilot lines. So we can put the same machinery to use for the pilot line to develop those uh, devices from the prototype step that they're at to the pre-production stage that they need to be at, then that's what we would use that machinery for. So what we're really short of at the moment is £200,000 to buy that machinery. And that's why we're not making 18650s. We obviously really want to do that. We want to make the 18650s, we want to do the pilot line so that we can use that as a lead-in for the other phases of the battery that we're developing. Currently, the plan is to have a look at the old carbon device as a starter device. Remember, it's essentially a supercapacitor and it's a pretty good one. So it's to look at this old carbon device as a starter device to producing prototypes for it. 
We're not quite sure how we want to proceed, but we do know we need to raise 200 grand. One thing that we're thinking of actually is launching an Indiegogo campaign, specifically raise that 200,000 to buy that machinery. And that is certainly something in our mind very seriously. But sort of picking up on things that people have said to me, which is, uh, for God's sake, Rob, stop mucking about and start making these things. So I thought, well, that's a fair comment, really. So a lot of people have been saying that sort of stuff to me, and we finally it's hit home, and we know we need to go to production. We're lacking about 200 grand to do that, and we know we need to come up with some way of actually raising that 200 grand. So one of the thoughts we've had was to run an Indiegogo campaign based on this all-capacity device. Now, you'll see in the other videos some of the performance characteristics. Where do we still need to go with it? Well, obviously, we still need to do the thicker version to see what the thicker version will do. We obviously need to give it a standard test for the ESR and for the um, leakage current. We obviously need to do that. And we're going to do that using uh, the Maxwell, Maxwell's application node, the one that defines the tests that Maxwell, Maxwell used for their supercapacitors. We're basically going to repeat those. Now, they take about uh, 72 hours of test, so I don't expect that tomorrow. That's going to be over the next sort of month as we do those tests. But I thought I'd show you where we were and give some explanation to the background of the way that we're thinking and some um, bit of insight into uh, the kind of direction that we're taking the work we're doing. And I thought that would be of interest to you, and um, thank you very much for watching.